first speaker this evening is Mr. Michael Hitchborn. He is from the Lepanto Institute, and Michael has done a lot of work in helping Catholics come to know, especially what's taking place with all the donations that we give. You always hear the phrase, whether it's a mystery or politics, follow the money. And if you follow the money, you will often find a lot of answers and a lot of truth. Uh, well, that's certainly true with what takes place within the institutional aspect of the church as well. Uh, it's in this world, so it needs money to function. And we, of course, as faithful Catholics, donate and support the Catholic Church. That's even one of the six precepts of the church, to support the mission of the church. Uh, but there's also a responsibility to obviously use all those donations to further the kingdom of Christ and, of course, to combat and resist uh, the revolution and, you know, the spirit of the world and we could say the kingdom of Satan. And unfortunately, because the crisis is so large, one of the most telltale marks, I think, by which many people realize what's going on, their eyes can be open to the crisis, is if they learn a little bit about what's taking place on that level. And so Michael has done a lot of just grassroots research. He's really kind of gotten down in the trenches. He has certainly taken a lot of hits for it. Uh, and, you know, he's been canceled and kicked out of here and kicked out of there, but that's often a sign that you're on the track of the truth and that you're trying to defend God's honor and Our Lady's honor. So we thank him for all the work that he's done, and I, for one, am very uh, enthusiastic and interested in seeing everything he has to tell us, because I know he's even been doing some, some cutting-edge investigation uh, these last few months and this last year. So if you'll help me welcome Mr. Michael Hitchborn. Thank you, David, for those kind remarks. More kind than I deserve. So David asked me to speak this evening on diabolical disorientation and how it dominates Catholic tithing. How's that for alliteration? <clears throat> In the fourth century, when Arius began preaching that God created God, God the Father created God the Son, and therefore our blessed Lord is not co-equal with God, he found that very few people uh, bought into his message. But Arius was a very clever man and devised a series of very simple and catchy songs that he began singing in port cities. Very soon, passers-by hearing the songs, but not paying careful attention to the lyrics, mind you, began to sing the songs to themselves and as they worked and walked through the streets. And before long, many people were singing Arius's simple yet heretical tunes. So, when Arius came back to preach, he found that he had a much more attentive audience than he had before. Without really thinking about what they were singing, the people who kept those catchy tunes in their minds unwittingly weakened themselves to Arius's message. Now, the heresy was defeated at the Council of Nicaea in 325, and Arius himself died in 336, but the match had already been lit, and like a brush fire, the Arian heresy swept through all of Christendom. In the words of St. Jerome, the world awoke with a groan to find itself Arian. For nearly 1,700 years, despite the multitude of heresies, wars, schisms, scandals, and controversies that would erupt throughout the history of the church, we have never seen the devastating and overwhelming impact of the Arian crisis. That is, until now. Today, our beloved church is in a deep crisis of faith. Modernism, what Pope St. Pius X dubbed the synthesis of all heresies, has perverted and twisted nearly every facet of the Catholic Church. The priesthood is attacked, the sacraments are attacked, the liturgy is attacked, good morals are attacked, and even the very nature of what it means to be a man or a woman is under attack. Nothing is safe from the perverse doctrines of the modernist, as everything they touch is reduced to ash. Because of this, faithful Catholics are bewildered. They find themselves questioning if the modernists are actually right, and if they themselves could possibly be wrong. How often do we hear people 
that we believed were at one point of a solid Catholic faith suddenly reverse their position on homosexuality. Even formerly traditional Catholics are now saying that Pope Francis was right to suppress the ancient rite of the mass. Like a raging fire in a tall building, everything is thrown into chaos. And between the heat and the smoke, the blaring fire alarms and the shouts and screams from within, it can now be very difficult to know which way is the way out. And that's precisely where we find ourselves now. Sister Lucia of Fatima is credited with coining the phrase diabolical disorientation with regard to the current crisis in the church. In a series of letters between 1969 and 1971, Sister Lucia mentioned this phrase multiple times to different people. I'll give just a couple of examples. In December of 1970, Sister Lucia wrote to a woman named Maria Teresa making reference to this diabolical disorientation coming to the church. She said, Our Lady requested and rec recommended that the rosary be prayed every day, having repeated this in all the apparitions, as if forewarning that these times of diabolical disorientation, we must not let ourselves be deceived by false doctrines that diminish the elevation of our soul to God by means of prayer. It is the diabolical disorientation that is invading the world and deceiving souls. It is necessary to confront it, and for this end, what I say here can be of use to you. In September of 1970, she wrote, uh, she wrote to a Sister Martins, and she said, Our poor Lord, who saved us with such love, and how little understood he is, how little loved, how badly served, it is painful to, be, to see such disorientation and in so many people who occupy positions of responsibility. As much as possible, we have to seek to make reparation by a union with the Lord that is ever more intimate, identifying him, ourselves with him so that he may be in us the light of this world which is immersed in the darkness of error, immorality, and pride. It hurts me to learn about what you say of, what already is also happening here. It is because the devil has been able to infiltrate evil under the guise of good, and they act as the blind leading the blind, as our Lord tells us in his gospel, and souls go on allowing themselves to be deceived. In 1973, at what is called the continuation of Fatima, our Lady spoke to a deaf nun in Akita, Japan, and this is what she told her on October the 13th of that year. The work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and oppressed by their confreres. Churches and altars sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromises, and the devil will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. The demon will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. The thought of the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sadness. If sins increase in number and gravity, there will no longer be pardon for them. Pay close attention to the words being used regarding the cause of confusion among the people of God. Compromises, infiltration, trading evil for good, arguments in the episcopacy, darkness, error, immorality, pride. Everything about our current situation has to do with false doctrines and errors that take away from the mission and purpose of Holy Mother Church. As Fulton Sheen said so often, if souls are not saved, then nothing is saved. At the Lepanto Institute, our mission is to expose and fight the enemies of Holy Mother Church, both from without as well as from within. And of late, it is more likely to find them within her hallowed halls than outside them. I'm sure everyone in here is well aware of the troubles caused by the current nonsensical synod on synodality. 
And while many are aware of the ridiculous claims of Cardinal Hollerick that the church's teachings regarding homosexuality can or should be changed, or the synodal documents promoting homosexuality and transgenderism, or even women's ordination, what most don't realize is that these things didn't just pop out of nowhere. And Our Lady, or Our Lady and Sister Lucia spoke of infiltration. There are many avenues of infiltration into Holy Mother Church, and it's been going on for a very long time, whether in the form of Freemasonry, homosexuals, or communists. Most of these groups operate under the cover of darkness, but every once in a while we find their foot soldiers operating out in daylight. Last October, we published a report on an organization called the Association of U.S. Catholic Priests, AUSCP. And what we discovered was quite enlightening. In 2013, the AUSCP helped found an international effort to change church teaching on a variety of issues. The organization is called the International Church Reform Network, ICRN, and AUSCP not only held a leadership position within it from 2013 to 2019, but it is still a member today. The ICIRN's main area of focus included discussing strategies for achieving the ordination of women to the priesthood, homosexual activism, and the establishment of what they call priestless parishes. Recent ICRN social media posts also include promotion of reproductive freedom, and organizations such as Catholics for Free Choice. What's interesting is that the synod reports that we've, been, uh, we've heard promoting these things are coming from the very same regions of the world where members of the ICI or ICRN have active members. This is not a coincidence. But all things considered, this is a very recent development. Also not a coincidence is that the AUSCP is deeply committed to what is commonly referred to as Catholic social justice. Wherever you hear this phrase, run, run away. While it is true that the phrase social justice was first used in church documents by the saintly Pope Leo XIII, the current understanding of Catholic social justice bears very little resemblance to what Pope Leo XIII was talking about. One of the AUSCP's absolute favorite organizations for social justice is the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. And if you're not familiar with the CCHD, let's talk. I've personally been investigating and reporting on the funding practices of the CCHD for 15 years. This past November, we published a highly detailed report on 66 of the 214 organizations receiving funds from the CCHD, showing that they promote socialism, abortion, contraception, and homosexual and transgender ideologies. But the CCHD didn't just spring into existence out of nowhere. Saul Alinsky is the father of the CCHD, an active, an active Marxist Alinsky recognized that in the 1940s that if he wanted to have real success in South Chicago, he needed to be working with the Catholic Church. His Industrial Areas Foundation formed the financial incredible bedrock for everything that he would do. In 1954, Alinsky met and became close friends with Monsignor Jack Egan, and it was through this friendship that Alinsky found doors at the chancery starting to open to him. In 1969, Monsignor Egan was able to convince the notorious Bishop Joseph Bernardin to take up a national collection to finance Alinsky's Industrial Areas Foundation. And in 1970, the CHD was launched. The Catholic part was tacked on in the 1990s when it realized that it had a PR problem. Since that time, the U.S. bishops have collected tens, if not millions of dollars that have gone to community organizing groups, either created by or inspired by Saul Alinsky. In short, they've been funding our enemies. But there's more to it than that. 
in order to convince faithful Catholics to be more supportive of CCHD grantees and funding efforts, bishops across the country have opened their parish doors to Alinsky's organizing groups in the name of interfaith dialogue. Groups like PICO, DART, Faith in Action, Industrial Areas Foundation, and many others have been meeting in parish, Catholic parishes, recruiting Catholic parishioners, and organizing Catholics in the name of social justice for 50 years. Incidentally, here's a little known fact. In 1958, Saul Alinsky had, a, had three private audiences with Archbishop Giovanni Montini of Milan, who would later become Paul VI. The purpose of the meetings? To discuss community organizing in Northern Italy. So you can see how the infiltration and perversion of, of charity of the Catholic Church uh, came, in, came to be a force for evil. Catholics who desire to use their money for the sake of the poor and downtrodden have had their attention shifted from the purpose of charity, which is to draw souls closer to Christ, and changed it into a political machine for their new understanding of Catholic social justice. And while that was taking place, another organization was rising to prey upon the, common, the Catholic sense of charity, and that organization is called Catholic Relief Services. Originally created to provide relief for people in Europe whose lives were upended by world war, Catholic Relief Services is little more than a subsidy of the federal government for the implementation of government programs. Since 2015, I have personally written over 32 major reports on the activities of Catholic Relief Services, proving beyond all doubt that it is directly involved in the spread and promotion of contraception and condoms. In 2014, Stephen Mosier of Population Research Institute and I collaborated on an investigation on a CRS-led project in, set in Kenya called SADIA, S-A-I-D-I-A, it's an acronym. We collected government reports and data sheets showing that CRS was using a sex ed program called Healthy Choices 2, and the program very very heavily promoted contraception and condom use. We sent an investigator to the project area on the ground to examine the literature, and this investigator was able to obtain photographic proof of that curriculum, including the contraceptive promoting elements, and, and to prove that it was being promoted and implemented by CRS and its partners. Our investigator even interviewed children who went through the program, and they admitted that they learned about contraception from the program saying that they were told it was a healthy choice. We even obtained, through a FOIA request, CRS's own reports to the government showing that it used healthy choices too in spreading it to the children. We also discovered through these documents that CRS implemented, implemented a condom-promoting series called Shuga, and it was near pornographic. It was awful. That, that came right out of CRS's own self-reports to the federal government. They said, yeah, we implemented this program called Shuga. In fact, we liked it so much, we might implement it in the second season of it. CRS completely denied anything having to do with these programs, despite personal meetings that I've had with them. Uh, and, and through these personal meetings, they never once were able to produce any counter to all of the uh, evidence that we put forward. I sat down, I gave them the evidence, they, they simply stepped back and said, we'll look into it, and they never ever got back to me ever again on it. In 2016, I, pro I produced a 56-page report containing inventory reports from a government-funded project called Access. These inventory reports showed that CRS both obtained and distributed over 2.5 million units of contraception, including abortifacients. CRS claimed that the inventory reports were in error, but then they admitted, even though they didn't personally get their hands dirty with the contraception, you know, our, our hands are off of that, but they said some other organization came in 
distributed the contraception and condoms in their area under their leadership. So it's kind of like a principal in a schoolyard saying, well, I'm not distributing drugs to the kids. I'm just letting a drug dealer go out in the schoolyard and sell it himself. In 2020, we produced six reports showing that CRS was responsible for implementing several government projects that referred girls to pro-abortion contraception providers, including near-pornographic sex education curriculums, including CRS-produced documents with CRS logo and copyright on them that were promoting condom use, and a government project called DREAMS, which is an acronym. It was created by Deborah Burks over at PEPFAR. The primary purpose and goal of DREAMS was to increase contraception use among young women. And that's just CRS. The Vatican-run umbrella group that CRS is a member of is called Caritas Internationalis. Not only are many members of Caritas extremely corrupt, but Caritas Internationalis is on the governing body of an international communist organization called the World Social Forum. This organization, and I've got photographs, I've got video, this organization literally marched through the streets with giant red flags with a yellow hammer and sickle on them. And ever since his election to the papal throne, Pope Francis has been 100% committed to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Just a little over a year after his election, Pope Francis was cited in a document of the United Nations Population Fund, oddly enough, and the title was Religion and Development Past 2015. Beginning on page 20 of this document, in a section explaining the nature and hopes of the SDGs, on page 21, it indicates that Pope Francis met with leadership of the United Nations, committing the entire Catholic Church to the SDGs. This is what it says. Appreciation of these issues is growing within the UN, as evidenced, for example, in the May 2014 meeting between the UN leadership and representatives of the Vatican and His Holiness, the Pope, on the SDG agenda. This meeting was followed by an audience between the UN Secretary General and His Holiness, who committed the Catholic Church to supporting the SDG efforts. So according to the Secretary General of the United Nations, Pope Francis agreed just months after announcing his intent to write an encyclical on human ecology to commit the Catholic Church to support the SDG efforts. The very next year, Pope Francis published Laudato Si, which makes 23 direct references to sustainable development. Since then, Pope Francis has made everything about his pontificate a steady drumbeat of global governance related to the SDGs. In June of 2016, Pope Francis addressed the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences on the topic of human trafficking. In his address, the Holy Father expressed his gratitude in the adoption of the SDGs, saying, I am grateful for the fact that the representatives of the 193 UN member states unanimously approved the new Sustainable Development Goals. In March of 2017, Pope Francis addressed the participants of the Vatican's a conference titled Religions and the Sustainable Development Goals, listening to the cry of the earth and the poor. In his speech, Pope Francis applauded the adoption of the 2015 uh, Sustainable Development Goals and even indicated that the SDGs would lead to a sustainable world order. In his opening remarks, quoting himself from Laudato Si, Pope Francis said, the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals approved by more than 190 nations in September 9, 20, 2015 were a great step forward for global dialogue, making or marking a virtual new and universal solidarity. Later in his speech, addressing what he called the myth of unlimited growth and consumption, he indicated that the SDGs we're merely providing the, form, the foundation for a sustainable world order. This is what he said. 
While it is certainly necessary to aim for a set of goals, development goals, this is not sufficient for a fair and sustainable world order. Also in 2017, speaking to the participants of the International Conference of the Centesimus Annus Pro Pontifice Foundation, Pope Francis urged more progress on sustainable development goals. I could provide even more examples, but you get the point. I don't have time to go into it now, but the SDGs, which are the brainchild of Jeffrey Sachs, are nothing short of communist population control plan thinly disguised as a poverty aid program. Just to be clear, despite each of these goals mirroring various planks of the communist man manifesto, SDGs three and five explicitly call for universal access to reproductive health care services, which, if you do a little digging, absolutely means both contraception and abortion. The diabolical disorientation experienced by Catholics has been a slowly boiling frog, and the radical transformation of faithful Catholics bears a remarkable resemblance to the transformation of the early Christians to Arians. In fact, we might say that the church today, of the church today, the world woke up and groaned to find itself modernist. I'm going to close with quite possibly the best explanation for what has happened as described by one of our very own enemies. I picked up a flyer a couple of years ago, this little flyer here, while I was haunting one of the AUSCP's annual assemblies. The inside of the, the AUSCP flyer explains that its mission is to enact constructive efforts to build a new church in place of the old one, establishing a new foundation with new pillars. Listen to what he says. Theologian, or theologian Herman Potmeyer views the Vatican II era as an unfinished building site familiar or similar to the building of a new St. Peter's Basilica during the 1500s. Construction began with the laying of a foundation and erection pillars and walls around the old Basilica of Constantine. What prepared the way for roof and dome to complete the new outer structure? That took decades. Meanwhile, the old church stayed in place, conditioning the progress of the new. Once the eternal structure was complete, the old basilica was removed. Similarly, Potmeyer sees Vatican II as designing a new church to develop around the existing one. The Council's 16 documents laid a new foundation. The four constitutions on literature, church, or liturgy, church, revelation, and church in the modern world are the new pillars. Consolidating and finishing a renewed church inside and out continues. Like St. Peter's and the works of previous councils, it is a work of centuries. Much remains to be done. We are all part of the renewal team. The divine project, building up the people of God for our era, is the challenge of our time. AUSCP's mission is to help us all respond to that challenge by working together as one. The AUSCP handout closes by stating that, it was create, that the AUSCP was created to build up this new church. It says this, we all need to be involved. We all need to work together with our leadership to accomplish the Spirit's mission of building up the church of our time, the people of God. AUSCP was created to help us do that. Be part of this great work of our lives, building a holy and truly Catholic church for our age. It should come as no surprise that one of the songs heard coming from the AUSCP's conference hall is titled, Sing a New Church, the refrain of which is this, Let us bring the gifts that differ, and in splendid varied ways, sing a new church into being, one in faith and love and praise. In light of the AUSCP's imagery of building up a new church and then tearing down the old one, 
Another AUSCP brochure calls for priests to, quote, be part of Hope's revolution, wherein the chairman of the AUSCP leadership, Father Bob Bonneau, exclaims that Vatican II's reforms and directions are irreversible. In this imagery of building a new church and tearing down an old one, the uh, all of this imagery of building up a new church and tearing down an old one may sound familiar to those who are amateur students of Catholic prophecy. In the 1800s, a Catholic mystic whose body bore the stigmata experienced a series of prophetic visions regarding what she called a counterfeit church. In her visions of this counterfeit church, she saw workers building this new church over an old one, which they intended to demolish. The following excerpts of Anne Catherine Emmerich's writings describe precisely what the AUSCP and its allies say of themselves. This is what she said. This is a long quote. I saw the fatal consequences of this counterfeit church. I saw it increase. I saw heretics of all kinds flocking to this city. I saw the ever-increasing tepidity of the clergy, the circle of darkness ever-widening. And now the vision become more extended. I saw in all places Catholics oppressed, annoyed, restricted, and deprived of liberty. Churches were closed, and great misery prevailed everywhere with war and bloodshed. I saw rude, ignorant people offering violent resistance. But this state of things lasted not long. Again, I saw in vision St. Peter's undermined according to a plan devised by a secret sect. While at the same time it was damaged by storms, it was delivered at the moment of greatest distress. Again, I saw the Blessed Virgin extending her mantle over it. I saw heart-rending misery, playing, drinking, gossiping, even courting going on in the church. All sorts of abominations were committed in it, they had even set up a nine-pin alley in the middle of it. Incidentally, there is a picture from a couple of years ago where they had a big banquet with Pope Francis in the narthex of one of the basilicas in Rome. The priests let things go their way and said Mass very irreverently. Only a few of them still a little intelligent and pious. I saw that many pastors allowed themselves to be taken up with the ideas that were dangerous to the church. They were building a great, strange, and extravagant church. Everyone was to be admitted into it in order to be united and have equal rights. Sound familiar? Protestants, Catholics, sects of every description. Such was to be the new church. I saw St. Peter's, a great crowd of men, were trying to pull it down whilst others constantly built it up again. Lines connected to these men, one with another and with others throughout the whole world. I was amazed at their perfect understanding. The demolishers, mostly apostates and members of different sects, broke off whole pieces and worked according to the rules and instructions. They wore white aprons, bound with a blue ribbon. Those are Masonic aprons. In them were pockets that had trowels stuck in their belts. The costumes of others were various. There were among the demolishers distinguished men wearing uniforms and crosses. They did not work themselves, but they marked out on the wall with a trowel here and where and how it should be torn down. To my horror, I saw among them Catholic priests. Whenever the workmen did not know how to go on, they went uh, they went to a certain one in their party. He had a large book which seemed to contain the whole plan of the building and the way to destroy it. I saw the strange big church that was being built in Rome. There was nothing holy in it. I saw just as I saw a movement led by ecclesiastics to which con contributed angels, saints, and other Christians. But there, were all the but there, all the work was being done mechanically. Everything was being done according to human reason. I saw all sorts of people, things, doctrines, and opinions. There was something proud, presumptuous, and violent about it. 
and they seemed to be working, they seemed to be very successful. I did not see a single angel or a single saint helping in the work, but far away in the background, I saw the seat of a cruel people armed with spears, and I saw a laughing figure which said, do build it as solid as you can, we will pull it to the ground. I saw that many of the instruments of the new church, such as spears and darts, were meant to be used against the living church. Everyone dragged in something different, clubs, rods, pumps, cudgels, puppets, mirrors, trumpets, horns, bellows, all sorts of things. In the cave below the sacristy, some people needed bread, meaning needed with their hands, but nothing came of it. It would not rise. The men in their little mantles brought wood to the steps of the pulpit to make a fire. They puffed and blew and labored hard, but the fire would not burn. They all, produ all they produced was smoke and fumes. Then they, they broke a hole in the roof and ran up a pipe, but the smoke would not rise, and the whole place seemed black and suffocating. Some blew the horns so violently that the tears streamed from their eyes. All in this church belonged to the earth, returned to the earth. All was dead, the work of human skill, a church of the latest style, a church of man's innovation like new heterodox church in Rome, end quote. The efforts of the enemy to create a new church on the facade of the old is manifesting before our very eyes. But Holy Mother Church is an unsinkable ship who takes her peoples to safe harbors. Right now, the diabolical disorientation that we are in is like a fog on the sea at night. It is dark and we cannot see the dangers lurking ahead. But in 1917, Our Lady appeared to three small children with a warning a message of hope, and a promise. Though the devil has obscured our vision, Our Lady, like a lighthouse on the shore, provides a sure path to safety. As Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich pointed out, a, mes a message we hear repeated in Fatima, it is at the last moment of greatest distress that the church will be delivered by the Blessed Virgin herself. Let us hold fast to the mooring lines of the rosary, Don the armor of the brown scapular and watch as the light provided by Our Lady guides us home.